Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm back with Mark McGuinness. Hi Mark. Hi Jo, nice like, to be back. Oh yeah, I reckon this must be four, fourth time on the show, maybe more. Fourth time lucky, I hope we get it right this time. <laughs> Uh, well, just in case people have missed your earlier interviews, Mark is an award-winning poet, a non-fiction author, a creative coach and international professional speaker, and a friend of mine as well, which is wonderful. Uh, his books for authors include Resilience, Motivation for Creative People, and Productivity for Creative People, all of which we have previous interviews on. And today we're talking about 21 Insights for 21st Century Creatives. And I should have said you're a podcaster as well. I forgot to say that. I am, yes. That was an idea I borrowed from you. <laughs> well, over the years, we have borrowed ideas from each other, which mm -hmm. I think is an important part of being a creative. But I wanted to start with um, an overarching question. This is going out at the beginning of 2019. Mm -hmm. The pace of change seems ever faster and many people are worried I think about some of the developments going on in the world technological political shifts and I think there's these these two major differing views so can you just start by kind of outlining what are the two major sort of views um, around creatives and the future and how can we face uh, the present and the future in a positive way so there are basically two schools of thought aren't there? There's, there are the enthusiasts, there are the people who are telling us this is the brave new world and all the gatekeepers have run away and the creatives can come out to play and we can go direct to our audience and take control of our platforms and attract our thousand true fans and become millionaires overnight. <laughs> or at least over 10 years <laughs> or maybe more. Well, you know, there's varying degrees of enthusiasm. Uh, I mean, on the other hand, there's, there's the, the, the doom mongers and the naysayers. These are the people who say that the Internet and smartphones are actually making us dumber by eroding our attention span, that Amazon is destroying literature, Instagram's destroying photography, um, Spotify or whatever is destroying the music business. And it's going to be it's getting harder and harder for creatives to make a living. And I know you've highlighted you know, on the one hand, you talk about great opportunities that there are for authors. And then we regularly see, at least here in the press in the UK, how it's the worst time ever for authors and they're all on the breadline. And it's, you know, so as ever, I think the truth is somewhere in between. And one thing I talk about in the book is the idea that it is always the best of times and the worst of times to be a creative. And I contrast our situation situation now with Geoffrey Chaucer, one of my heroes, his situation in the 14th century, writing his poetry above a, a bustling gate and an open sewer. Um, you know, and these days, I think, by and large, I think we've got it quite cushy compared to that. Um, but it, it, there's definitely an issue, I think, particularly around technology in society, that on the one hand, the technology gives us the tools to do things like this and you know, you and I have got podcasts, we've got books, we've got blogs that go out to thousands of people every week, which was kind of unheard of when I was small. And But on the other hand, there's all the distraction, there's all the interruptions, there's the pressure to be always available and always engaging, um, not to mention sitting at the computer too long. Mm -hmm. So I think it, my stance is it's, it's a two-edged sword, but, you know, it was always thus. You know, whether you're in the 18th century or the 21st century or whatever's going to be happening in the 24th century. And our job as creatives is to try and navigate that, to take advantage of the good and minimise the downside. Yeah, and I think also it's kind of a constant juggling act. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I I want to learn everything. Like, I love learning more and more, and both of us listen to podcasts as well. And, and you know, yeah. I listen to one of your shows, and I'm like, oh, that person's interesting. And then you go down a rabbit hole, and you find another podcast, or you find another book, and, and, and it all just gets a bit overwhelming. And that um, I find that overwhelm, to me, the best thing to do is... Uh, turn it all off and step away. Like I take my journal and just go analog with my hand writing, hand writing, which is kind of crazy. But it's, yeah. it, you know, it feels like I don't want to let, I don't want to let it go, but you kind of have to step out of the stream sometimes to recharge. Yeah, I think it's very important to know when you're on stage, so to speak, 
and when you're off stage and either working, doing focus work or doing something that's got nothing to do with the internet or business or, or writing whatsoever because creatively, not to mention health-wise, as, as you know, it's, it's essential. If you're always plugged in, if you're always on, if you're always available, your work will suffer and sooner or later your health will suffer too. So mm. um, personally, I like to have certain, I mean, for me, it's fairly easy. I divide my day into the mornings when I, I'm in airplane mode, so to speak, and I'm writing or creating. Uh, this morning I was working on my podcast. And then afternoons I'll be on Skype or Zoom with clients. That's when I have my social media time. That's when I answer my emails. And then in the evenings, again, I'm pretty well switched off from email. I might check in on Twitter or whatever, but that's family time for me. So mm. that, you know, that, that's my rhythm. Some of my clients hold their hands up in horror when I describe what a boring life I live. <laughs> <laughs> but for you, it's, you know, think about your own life. When do you write best? When do you want to be focused? When's the best time for you to be engaged and available? And try and have some, you know, some fairly strong rules around that because that's a way of getting the best of both worlds. What you don't want is for one to be interrupting and being a distraction from the other. Mm. Yeah, so uh, you definitely go into a lot more about that in the productivity book, which is fantastic. And I think what's interesting about this book is you do bring in insights across the whole kind of creative career. But one thing I w so I'm going to uh, sort of uh, read a couple of the great sentences from the book and then kind of uh -huh. ask you what they mean. So the first one I like is, quote, forget the career ladder, start creating assets, end quote. So what do you mean by that? And what are some of the different asset types that authors uh, in particular can be creating? Well, this is kind of in response to partly my own situation and also working with clients and talking to other creatives. It's very easy for us to be, if you like, the odd one out in the family or the group of friends and to be, you know, have well-meaning people close to us say, why can't you be a bit more like your cousin George who's doing so well in the law firm <laughs> or the accountants or whatever it is. And, and you look at cousin George, bless him, and he's, he's climbing the ladder. He's got promotions. He's got job titles. He's got a company car. He's got a corner office, whatever. And on a bad day, it's very easy to be sat there thinking, and what have I got? <laughs> it's just me in my studio or in my writing desk. And I don't know, I've had another rejection or my latest release didn't go so well or I'm stuck on a difficult part of the book. What, am I just kidding myself? Am I wasting my time? And I think, but if you compare somebody, I'll give you an extreme example, someone at the very top, of our industry, somebody like Stephen King. Well, he doesn't generally worry about whether he's in line for promotion at the firm or whether his job is secure or, you know, what the people at the boardroom think of him because he's got this body of work, which is effectively an asset or a set of assets. He's got mm -hmm. all these books. He's got a great brand. He's got the intellectual property in the books. He's got that kind of recognition that if Stephen King were to email you and say, hey, Joe, do you think we could collaborate on a project? You'd at least take the call, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd be like, anything you want, Stephen. <laughs> right? So he doesn't, sh he doesn't want for opportunities or money. Now, maybe we're not all going to reach that level, but even if you've got one book, that's an asset for your career. That can be earning money. That can be bringing you readers. That can be growing your mailing list, your audience, your network. Mm. If it's a non-fiction book, you can be selling consulting and other products off the back of that. If it's a fiction book, then that's the start of your audience. And you'll be, of course, writing the next book and the next book and then the next book. The more books you have, the more um, enthusiastic subscribers to your mailing list or followers on social media, the more people know, like, and love your work, the more opportunities you have and the easier it is to leverage that into income. 
Mm. Well, I, I, want, I wanted to ask you particularly about the, there's different types of assets. I often, again, like you mentioned, I talk about books that can earn you income for the long term. But I yeah. also what's interesting is you talk about different kinds of assets. So reputational assets, I thought was interesting because you are a poet and I, which is one of those things I love about you. And you're like, I, no, I don't just do like poetry I do like quite serious poetry and it's not you know your translation of Chaucer which has won you an award um this is not something that is necessarily an income generating asset but talk a bit about reputational assets when it comes to creatives yeah so I think there's three basic kind of rewards on offer apart from the sheer joy of of doing it in terms of writing or making some kind of art you've got money You've got fame, i.e. how many people know about you, and you have reputation in the artistic sense. So, you know, to take an extreme example again, uh, Jeffrey Hill, who died last year, widely considered, or well, within the poetry world, to be possibly our great, the greatest living poet in English. Most people had never heard of him. <laughs> I haven't heard of him. <laughs> and I heard him interviewed, and he was saying, you know, when I look at my annual royalty statements, I appear to have hardly any readers at all. And yet... <laughs> In a, a lot of people's estimation, he's a genius. And within the poetry world, that I mean, he was Oxford professor of poetry. He was professor in the States. He, he always had plenty of opportunity, and he worked really hard for that. So, and again, if you're talking about popular entertainment, writing thrillers or romance or something, it's more at the fame end of the spectrum. Maybe you don't care what the New York Times or the mm -hmm. Times Literary Supplement says or doesn't say about your work but if you've got millions of readers then hey who cares so and i think it's really you know there's a huge difference if you're releasing your 20th book and you've got thousands of people on your list and and looking for your work online to releasing the first one so yeah the book is an asset but you also need the social assets either in terms of critical reputation that can create opportunities in your artistic field mm. or just in terms of the sheer number of fans that you have and readers that you have waiting for that next book because if you do this right you should make a lot more money from that book number 20 than book number one Mm. And um, it's interesting because that reputational asset, I mean, I still want to win an award. You know, I'm award nominated, but I'm not an award winning author. So to me, that is an ego goal, a reputational goal, um, right. you know, and I want to do that in my lifetime. And I will probably have to give up an income goal in order to have that yeah. goal because they don't necessarily go together. But I'm, I did want to come back on the money side. So another quote from the book, stop trying to earn money, start creating value. And I thought about this a lot. I mean, it's definitely something that I think I've tried to do with the creative pen. And I find it's easier with nonfiction in a way because it's kind of, it's easier to answer someone's problem. Like someone has mm. a problem and yeah. you can answer it with nonfiction. So you feel yeah. like, yes, I'm giving them value. But entertainment, which let's face it, fiction, poetry, I guess it's entertainment. It comes under entertainment. <laughs> Even if it's not always entertaining. <laughs> but I mean, it, it might come under inspiration, but it's not usually under information. It's, it's not going to help you fix your boiler. No. <laughs> so, so let's talk about creating value with fiction and poetry. How do we change our mindset around not trying to earn money, but creating value with, with entertainment? Well, firstly, I, I would suggest that we just pause for a moment and think of the the billions of dollars of value in the global entertainment issue, industry, of which we're a part. So, I, yeah, in some sense, it's easier to say, yeah, you, you buy a book that's going to help you, I don't know, exercise more or procrastinate less or or whatever it may be. And, and there's a clear practical value for that. But, I mean, there's a huge appetite for fiction slightly smaller appetite for poetry but <laughs> i don't know it's one of the apparently ingram spark have said poetry is their biggest um biggest segment in print print publishing right, well, right now i should sign up to ingram spark <laughs> sooner rather than later in that case <laughs> <laughs> so i think it's i mean people do pay money for fiction particularly and i think the point i was trying to make there is just because you work really hard it doesn't you, you don't get paid for suffering and working hard you mm. get paid when you deliver something to market that is valued by your audience so 
you know, if you're a fiction writer and you're doing literary fiction, it's not going to be as easy to make money from that as it is if you're writing genre fiction. And usually people have made their peace with that. Sometimes they haven't and they complain about it loudly. But you've got to think about the reward that you want. But if you're interested in money, then it's really about looking through the other end of that telescope and thinking, mm. what does the reader want? What, what can I give her that, you know, is it more of this kind of book? Is it books in a different kind of format? And I know, Joe, you're very good at this. You've got all your books coming out in all <laughs> possible formats. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and, it's, and that's a very smart thing to do. And it's something I know you've nudged me to do more with my books. And I can be a bit lazy about that because I want to go and write the next book, which is, you know, working hard rather than smart. So it's about looking at how can I leverage what I've got in terms of existing assets and intellectual property. Things like film rights can come into play as well. And also thinking about, well, what could I create that would have the biggest impact for the least effort? I think that's a really interesting question mm. to ask rather than what's going to be. And, and again, I'm the world's worst at this in some ways because I'd much rather be translating medieval poetry than writing something that's um, going to be mind-bendingly useful. But... <laughs> 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 and therein lies the problem for creatives and right. or the like you said making your peace with it you are at peace with the fact that you would rather spend a morning translating half a line of Chaucer <laughs> or yeah. w one word or whatever wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, than, than creating another intellectual property asset like a book in another format for example so I think this, it does come back to mindset. And I wanted to ask you about this, about, and the mindset stuff comes into the value and the earning money. Yeah. How, so how do we change our money mindset? Because if you were chasing after that other hundred dollar bill, you wouldn't do that Chaucer, but you're not. So you're, and you know, I've known you for a long time and I do find you very mature in the mindset thing. You come out of psychotherapy, you know, you, you have a, that attitude that's a healthy attitude towards money, which is, yes, I'd like to make money, but no, I'm not going to give up everything else in order to make money. So how do we balance that and change our mindset if we just think it's how many hours I work? Right. So I think balance is, is the word I would have put out there because it, it's really important. Firstly, you know yourself and you know your inclinations. Mm -hmm. So I know I just wouldn't be happy if I was writing stuff that was designed to be purely commercial all the time. I could look at a spreadsheet and come up with a logical argument for that. But my heart sinks just as I, <laughs> as I entertain that scenario. So I know I've got to come up. Think about your work as almost like an ecosystem. So in my ecosystem, I have some time, not all day, every day, devoted to poetry. I have other times devoted to making something that's going to be useful for my audience, like a book like this or a podcast. I also have a coaching business, which is my main business. And that is, you know, that's something I definitely don't neglect. Mm -hmm. So typically I spend, you know, as I said, I spend my mornings writing, the afternoons with uh, my clients, so I'm, I'm balancing both sides every day. But, you know, one of the things I've noticed, <clears throat> and my coach, Peleg Top, pointed out to me a while ago, is that actually my kind of clients, one big reason they want to work with me is that I am following my own path. I'm doing my poetry. I'm doing something that they respect at, at a you know, reasonably high artistic level. So, actually, they all... You, you, you've got this whole ecosystem and they all depend on each other. Like the little fish and the jellyfish and the, the, big, the big rays shark. And, and the big shark. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget the sharks. And it's very easy to, for, to come in and say, <clears throat> I believe they did this at 3M years ago. You know, the people who made the, the post-it notes. And earplugs. They are my favourite earplugs, 3M. And earplugs. Well, they got some efficiency experts to come in and say, right, this company's doing really well. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold today. This company's doing really well. Just think how much better we could make them if we make them more efficient. So they went around the office and surprise, surprise, they found loads of examples of wastage, people hanging out by the water cooler, having <laughs> unproductive conversations and office design. You know, you couldn't get too many people in the room, etc. And I mean, you, you can guess the outcome. They killed 
the innovation. They, they were in danger of killing the goose that was laying the golden eggs. Mm. And fortunately, they realized in time and they rode back. So I don't think you can look at a creative career and, and assess it purely in terms of efficiency and productivity. I think you've got to have the creative element in, if nothing else, because it buoys you up and it gives you energy. You know, if I've written my thing this morning, then I'm very happy to go out there and, and help someone else with their thing as, as a client or, you know, to be doing some marketing stuff and putting things out into the world that are going to help other people. So I think as as writers, we've got to find that balance between what we'd ideally like to write and maybe we do that and something that's more pragmatic or maybe we find something that's that's a bit more of a sweet spot. I like writing this there's a good market for it I'll focus all my efforts there Mm, I think you're right about I mean I find as well that I need the fiction and the non-fiction to kind of satisfy both sides of me and also I don't think I would have any credibility I mean if I was only writing non-fiction that's fine but I don't feel I could have the um I guess the authority to even talk about this stuff unless I had books (laughs) So, yeah. you know, it's important yeah. for me, even if I didn't want to do it. I mean, it's a credibility thing to keep creating as someone who talks to creatives. But also, as you say, it's um, it's like a, a life thing. Why else are we doing this? Um, and I was uh, also reminded when you were talking about that, I just spent a couple of days in London last week. I went to um, Edward Byrne Jones, which was a pre-Raphaelite, mm. uh, you know, artist. And I, I generally spent about two and a half days just wandering around London, just looking at stuff and taking pictures and writing in my journal. And, it, you know, some people would say that was not productive, but it, that it gave me lots of ideas and yeah. so what, what and I've been on your show obviously talking about the healthy writer and of course yeah. on my show so what, what are what are the what's the place for rest slash relaxation slash recharging if people you know when do people I think we know when we hit burnout but how do we sort of incorporate that well one of the things I say a lot to my clients is your body is your best coach if you pay attention it's giving you feedback about how tired it is or how stiff it is or how fed up it is of being cooped up in this office or or whatever it is. But usually what do we do? We ignore it and we just kind of focus on here and just think I'll have another Pro Plus or some more coffee and I'll <laughs> get another gadget and make myself more productive that way. And I've certainly got into trouble by doing that. I've had excuse me, health and fitness problems from that. And I've learned the hard way from listening to it that actually I need to build in more time. So years ago, when my doctor was kind of signing me off with stress, he forbade me from doing any work in the evenings for my exams. Mm. And he said, you will actually be much more um, effective. You'll be able to learn more during the day if you take your evenings off. Now, at that time, it felt terrifying to me but that's because I was stressed out (laughs) Um, and I'm pretty well stuck to that so it's quite rare that I will work at the weekend or an evening these days I'm also trying to build in more movement during the day so I'm learning Tai Chi partly from a little nudge I got from reading this great book called The Healthy Writer (laughs) thinking okay (laughs) I should be doing a bit more about that and the nice thing about Tai Chi is I can do it during the day, in between mm. writing, in between clients, even in between email. It's not – you don't need to go and get changed and you don't get all hot and sweaty. So I can do 10 minutes here and there during the day. So that's making a big difference. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're listening to this and you're wondering where to start, start by listening to your body and noticing what are the aches and pains. And also one thing I noticed – when I got a sit-stand desk, which this desk, I can press a button and stand up. And, and, and Well, it's not that I press the button to stand up. The desk will stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stand up manually. But one of the things I do now is I sit and I stand until I feel like I want to sit. And I sit until I feel like I want to stand. And what I've noticed is for years and years, I've been ignoring that urge to fidget and move about and get up. So... Mm. I would say starts and finishes with the body. Fantastic. That's, um, of course, we've talked about this a lot. And I think uh, as this goes out, beginning of 2019, let's everybody try and listen to our bodies more because it really is. It's so incredible. Like I've um, very much moved to mainly a lot of more plant-based eating in the last kind of six months. 
and I just feel so much better for it. And this is not, you know, I'm, I'm not recommending that everyone do that. It's just that by listening to how things feel in the body, you kind of, you can, you can change. And changing is so important too, right? We all need different things at different parts of our lives. So, you know, that's important. What worked for you two years ago might not work for you now, for example. And that's true in our businesses, right, as well. Yeah, well, I mean, if there's one constant these days, it's change. And I think it's, again, you know, the thing that I noticed about the happiest as well as the most successful creatives are the ones who go, oh, everything changed again. Where's the opportunity? Mm. What can I do? I mean, there's really, there's, there's no time to sit around and complain because the world is not going to change in relation to that. No. I know because I tried it for several years. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, this is something that we always talk about when we get together. It's like, so what's what's moved on since we last had a chat, yeah. and what you know, what do we need Lots to be? News. Yeah, what do we need to be doing next? So um, I do want to ask you because the book uh, has a lot of sort of really positive tips and things to to change in terms of mindset and potentially business practices. But I love the fact you also say um, there is always a crappy part to any business. And yeah. one of the things I find particularly authors are like, oh, you know, I just want someone to do the publishing for me, or I just want someone to do the marketing for me. All yeah. I want to do is write. And I'm sure you hear that in lots of different guises. So how oh, yeah. do you know, how do we make sure that not everything's crap? And, you know, what are your kind of tips in dealing with that crappy bit? Well, I think so. This is something I see a lot because I work with clients across all the different creative industries and arts. So, you know, authors can complain about the publishing industry or can complain about Amazon or or whatever. People in the film industry, there's a lot of politics. People in the advertising mm -hmm. industry, there's a hell of a lot of politics and um, a fair bit of brutality as well. And one thing I noticed is <clears throat> you can always find there will whatever path you pick, there will be a crappy part. And that will be the, you know, the proverbial frog that you have to swallow every Monday morning when you go in to work. But the ones who are happy are the ones who say, yeah, I accept this because this is the price of the bit that I love. Mm. And if you can do that, then that's part of turning pro in Stephen Pressfield's language. You know, the, the pro is that someone who says, yeah, it does suck. You know, I'd rather be writing than marketing, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because otherwise you're in the, is it Peter de Vries, the, the Australian novel, novelist? I assume he was saying this tongue in cheek. He said, I love being a writer. What I can't stand is the paperwork. <laughs> It is a bit like that. I mean, there is that bit and you just kind of go, oh, do I have to, do like you said about me putting all my books into large print um, and hardback. Yeah. It, I'm thrilled about it, but boy, it's a pain in the neck because I have to keep uploading all these files and filling in these fields. And it's just like, ah, oh, but there are benefits. So I'll do it. It's a tough life. There's, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> no, that's why. That's, <laughs> that's actually what I like about the book, um, and to everyone out there, uh, it's it's one of it's a good book for kind of kicking you up the um, up the behind a little. This is not a oh nice nice creative book. This is a this is how you can be more effective, which I like, um, uh, which is fantastic. So as we are uh, sort of we're recording this uh, just before um, the end of 2018, but it goes out in 2019. So I was wondering about you personally what are you excited about in 2019 and even beyond like what what are you taking as your next steps well so there's on my podcast the 21st century creative i'm just about i'm into season three now which is starting almost to feel like a proper podcast and so i'm looking to do at least another two seasons of that in 2019. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things I've discovered about having a podcast now is that it's a great excuse to get in touch with people and sate my own curiosity. You know, if I see somebody making amazing art or doing something interesting in technology or personal development, I can send them an email and say, hey, I'd love to have you on the show. And I ask them the questions that I'm curious about. So apart from any other benefits that come from having the show, it's just a great way of educating myself. Mm. by interviewing lots of very smart people doing very clever and interesting things. So there's 
the podcast. Um, I'm also creating another podcast, which is top secret for now, but will be completely different in form and content to the 21st century creative. And then I'm always learning something in my personal life. So Tai Chi is my latest enthusiasm. I'm very pleased to hear that the first thing I need to learn is a 74 move routine. <laughs> it takes about three years to learn. <laughs> so I found a great teacher who's helping me with that. Um, I'm also learning Japanese, which is an ongoing project. So, uh, and finishing my poetry collection. So there's always plenty to, to do. And I think, again, it's, there is maybe a bit of tough love in the book, but at the same time, and I do come down on the side of the enthusiasts, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah, I do. definitely. <laughs> I we do wouldn't be friends unless great, you did. <laughs> right, and it, it is a great time of opportunity, and there is amazing things that we can do with the technology. So, um, yeah, the, the, the 2019 is going to be yet another year of discovery. Yeah, exactly. I'm interested in the audio because, of course, you and I talk about this all the time. Uh, I think I may have even kicked you into doing the podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you the... may have had something to do with that, yes. <laughs> in, in the first place. But I'm interested because, again, you have, um, you know, you have your coaching business, but you have books, you have, um, you know, the, the website, and you, you have a lot of technology as, as someone, you know, many people don't think that poets necessarily are really into tech. But I, yeah. I wonder if you, you know, can you talk about how you think that um, the podcast particularly and audio, I guess, makes a difference in your business? So, Because I know a lot of people are thinking about audio in 2019. Audio books are still going nuts um, as we speak on Black Friday, the Alexa and Echoes and everything. Again, the biggest seller. We've got a massive kind of um, uh, huge scope in audio, I think, 2019. Is, is going to be big. So what are your thoughts on how it fits into how you make income, I guess, with, with audio? So you mean business-wise rather than creatively? Both. Both, really. Okay. Well, I think, first of all, what I love about it is it feels like a much more direct and immediate connection. I mean, I had a blog for over 10 years before I started podcasting, and it was very interesting. I remember one day a client said to me, I've been a coaching client said, I've been reading your blog for years, but it never occurred to me to hire you until I heard you interviewed on someone's podcast. And it may have been your podcast, actually, Joe. <laughs> a while ago. And she said, because then I've just felt that connection. And I knew I, this was somebody I wanted to work with. And so if you are a coach or a consultant of any kind, then I think there's a really important lesson there, because what we sell is, is conversations. So certainly I've seen the benefit of that. I've had people saying, oh, when I heard your podcast, I knew I wanted to talk to you. Even people who find me, say, on a search engine or, or via a book, nearly always by the time we have the first coaching conversation where we decide if we want to work together, it, they will say, oh, and I've been listening to the show. Mm. And they've been getting a sense of what I'm like from that. Um, and I can point them to past episodes where I've actually interviewed previous clients of mine. So certainly from that point of view, it's been really great. Um, also, just in terms of content production, it's a lot. I wouldn't say it's quicker and easier necessary, but I, I am certainly creating more content. I think one thing I discovered that audio does take a bit more work when producing text. But again, I great tip I got from you was to start putting transcripts of the audio onto the website so you get SEO benefits as well as accessibility from that. And I just think overall it is a, a really great way to give more to the audience because I think we all feel when we hear somebody's voice, we feel a much stronger connection to them. Um, I will be getting into audio books in 2019, so that will be another, hopefully another income stream from there. So I would say certainly if you're curious about it, then I would say creatively and business wise, it's one of the best things I've done in several years. Mm, yeah, and obviously me too. And like you, I have another podcast coming in 2019. Yay. <laughs> and it's funny, isn't it? And, and also maybe you could comment on because you you use dictation a lot. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're actually using your your voice to write your books as well. Yeah. So have you found any any changes or anything different through doing podcasting and kind of creating a different work for audio versus dictation for, for writing, or are they kind of completely different? Well, poetry is always completely different. 
So I quite often write that in my head and then write it down afterwards. Um, mm. I tried using voice recognition, it doesn't work, so I write poetry quite slowly. But certainly for prose, this was actually something, again, I discovered through not listening to my body. I had really bad RSI from having typing too much, having a bad posture and so on. Couldn't use a keyboard for six months, which was kind of inconvenient. This is 10 <laughs> years ago when you have an internet-based business. And I discovered Dragon, naturally speaking, and started using it, which you could say probably saved my business because I could actually work mm -hmm. again. But even when the RSI recovered, I discovered I preferred writing prose like this because I could make a few notes and really crank out an article or a chapter much more quickly and easily speaking than typing. And so I stuck with it. And one of the, some of the feedback I've got is people said, oh, it sounds much more like your voice now when I read your book mm. than it did before. Yeah. Um, much, much, much clearer, more of a flow. So, yeah, so I use Dragon Dictate now, which is the Mac version, which isn't quite as good as the, the PC one, but I'm not going to buy a PC. So... <laughs> Oh my goodness! You must be one of the the, the last creatives left on a PC. I, I, I'm saying that now, and there'll be half the half the listeners use a PC no, just... on a on a Mac. I, I've got a Mac, but I'm not going to buy a PC. I did actually. Oh yes, install... sorry, the other way around. Yeah. Years, yeah, yeah, years ago, I did install Windows on my MacBook Pro because it, that was the only way I could get Dragon naturally speaking to work. But now they've got a Mac version that's quite good. So they just... have. No, that's fantastic. Okay, oh. so where can people find you and your books and your podcast and everything you do online? Okay, so for the podcast, it's 21stCenturyCreative.fm. That's the 21st Century Creative podcast. Then 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash 21 Insights is where you can get the book, 21 Insights for 21st Century Creatives. And the ebook edition for that is free. If anybody's interested in getting some help as a one-to-one -one coaching client, then my site is lateralaction.com, and you can go there. And you find my other books and blog that I've had for about 10 years or something as well. So. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mark. That was great. Thank you, Joe. It's always a pleasure.